Here we're going to build up the basic notions of set theory and we're going to use what is sometimes called a naive approach which is after the book called Naive Set Theory which is a super famous book on this approach and what I mean by that is we're going to only look at set theory as an application to working in other fields of mathematics like abstract algebra or real analysis or topology or so on and so forth. Not set theory as it applies to a subject itself which is really more concerned with with logic and the foundations of math. So let's get to it. So as a definition, we'll say a set is a collection of objects known as elements. And you might say, well, is everything a set? Well, that's a bit tricky and that gets our toes into this world of um, kind of abstract set theory. And no, not everything uh, is a, not every collection of objects is a set. There are these things called classes, but that's kind of neither here nor there. The set with no elements is known as the empty set, so we'll generally write it like this, a zero with a cross through it, or less commonly like this, which is just like a set with nothing in it. Two sets are said to be equal if they contain exactly the same elements, and so written kind of in logical terms, that means that A equals B if um, X is in A, if and only if X is in B. And so that tells you that if X is in A, then it's got to be in B. If X is in B, then it has to be in A. So they have exactly the same elements. Then uh, finally, for our last definition, the cardinality of a set is the number of elements it contains. And there's a bunch of notations for this. We'll just use this uh, um, A with two like absolute value lines uh, next to it. Okay, so now I want to look at some common sets of numbers. And these will be sets of numbers that you generally run into in those aforementioned classes like abstract algebra, or real analysis, topology, so on and so forth. So maybe the first ones we could look at are the natural numbers. So we have one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So notice there are infinitely many elements in this set. In other words, the cardinality of this set is infinite. And if you know something about cardinalities and types of infinity, you might say, well, hey, this has a more precise name to it, but we're not going to get to that right now. Okay, then next we have the integers, and so that would be like all positive and negative natural numbers and zero. So let's put dot, dot, dot here, and then minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and then dot, dot, dot. Great. And then notice the cardinality of the integers is also infinite. Okay, next we would have the rational numbers. So those are going to be all ratios of integers. So we might call that as P over Q, such that P and Q are integers, but Q is not allowed to be zero because we can't divide by zero. Okay, next uh, we'll have the real numbers. So I'll just write this as a sentence, all real numbers. You might say, well, why aren't we defining this um, as we define these? And that's because the precise definition is tricky. Uh, in fact, a lot of times in beginning real analysis books, it's saved for the appendix, or I know a lot of instructors like to assign it as a final project if there are group projects in a certain class. So this is actually kind of tricky. We might see it um, in my series of real analysis videos, which are upcoming. And then finally, the complex numbers. So there, those are all numbers of the form A plus BI, such that A and B are real numbers. And then I is this special number that when you square it, you get negative 1. Okay, so that's the complex numbers. Now, um, like I said, the natural numbers is, has infinite cardinality. The real numbers also has infinite cardinality, but just kind of as an aside, the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly bigger than the cardinality of the natural numbers, which is something that we'll show a bit later. And then uh, maybe like we could look at some other types of sets which aren't numbers. Like maybe we could think of the set like this. Maybe A could be equal to orange and blue. So that would be a set of two colors, orange and blue. So the size of that set or the cardinality of that set is two. Or we could look at this set which also has cardinality 2, but it kind of trickily has cardinality 2. Let's say B is the set containing the set of natural numbers and the set of real numbers. So notice, the, like the number 2 is not an element of B. 
The only two elements of B are the entire set of natural numbers and the entire set of real numbers. So in fact, the cardinality of A here is two and the cardinality of B is also two. It just happens to be that they have two do totally different types of elements. A has elements that are colors and B has elements which are these infinite sets themselves. Okay, good. So now the next thing that I want to do is clean this up and then we're going to discuss something called set builder notation, which is a great way of uh, defining a set. Next, I want to describe three methods for describing sets. First is the roster strategy for describing a set, and in this case, you just list all of the elements. Like here, we're looking at the set containing just one, two, and three. You might think that this wouldn't work for infinite sets, but it does if there's a pattern. So like we had on the previous board, the integers, we wrote dot, 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 negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. It's pretty obvious there that we're listing all of the integers. So that would be a roster way of listing all the integers, just like this is a roster strategy for listing uh, the numbers one, two, and three. Next, we could describe a set verbally. So this set verbally could be described, well, a number of different ways, but we could describe it as all natural numbers that are less than four. Notice it could also be less than or equal to four, but uh, maybe less than four is an another way to do it. Okay, good. And then finally, maybe the most useful from a mathematical standpoint is this set builder notation. And set builder notation has this standard setup. You have these curly braces and this line in the middle, which means the word such that. So let's go ahead and write that. So this line means such that when you read it off or sometimes it's a colon, uh, depending on the author. And the general setup here is that on the left, you have the general shape of an element, and then on the right, you have a specific rule that it satisfies. So here we would have n is a natural number, that's how we read that, n is an element of the natural numbers, such that n is less than four. So notice the set builder notation just made us uh, read this sentence, basically. Okay, so these are three ways of describing this set. So now let's look at some other ways. Maybe like even integers. We could do that a couple of different ways. Maybe we could write 2n such that n is in z. So notice the general shape of an even integer is it's 2 times any integer. Good. And then the specific rule that n has to follow, it has to start off being an integer. Here's another way of doing the even integers. We could write them as m such that m equals 2n for some n in z. Great. So that would be another way of writing the even integers. Then what about odd integers? Well, we could do something pretty similar for that. We could write... 2n plus 1, where n is an integer. So notice odd numbers are just one off from even numbers. Or we could write it like this, m such that m equals 2n plus 1 for some n, which is an integer. That would be another way of writing odd integers. We could write prime numbers. We could do this a couple of different ways as well. Maybe we could write p such that, or maybe we'll write p, which is a natural number, such that p is prime. Good. Or we could write p is a natural number such that um, if p equals a, b, then a or b equals 1. So in other words, if you factor a prime into a product of two numbers, one of them has to be one. That's another definition for a prime. Um, and then maybe like perfect cubes. So there's two ways to do that, just pretty similar to this even and odd integers. We could write maybe n cubed such that n is an integer. That would be one possibility. Or we could write m such that m equals n cubed for some n, which is an integer. So that would be another way of, of getting at perfect cubes. Okay, good. So a bunch of practice with set builder notation. I want to clean up the board and look at a couple more examples. So here's some other sets that we can describe with set builder notation. So maybe like solutions 
to the equation x squared equals 2. So we could define that. So this would be x such that x squared equals 2. Maybe we could say here x is in R just to general to show that we're talking about real numbers here. So now obviously we can also write this in just a, the roster method as negative the square root of 2 and then positive the square root of 2. And then maybe an interesting thing is to do, well, what if we take x from q such that x squared equals 2? Well, we know that the square root of 2 is not rational, so that means this has to be the empty set because the general shape is a rational number, and we're looking for rational numbers that square to 2, but we know there are no such rational numbers. And then maybe what about intervals like from calculus? Like, for example, what if we have the interval 3 to 6, which is open on the left-hand side and closed on the right-hand side? So in other words, on the number line, it looks something like this. So we'll put a 3 here, a 6 here. This will have an open circle here and a closed circle here and then shade it in. So notice we can write that in set learned notation pretty easily as well. This is x in the real numbers such that x is strictly bigger than 3 and less than or equal to 6. And then we can do this similarly for all types of intervals. So I'll maybe give one more example. Let's say we have the interval a to plus infinity. So that would be given by x, which is a real number, such that x is bigger than or equal to a, because notice we're including a in this case. Okay, so let's maybe look at something similar to these, but restricted to natural numbers or integers or something. What about this? What if we look at all m, which are integers, such that the absolute value of m is less than uh, or equal to 3? So, maybe we could do something on the side. Notice that the absolute value of m is less than or equal to 3 is the same thing as saying m is bigger than m is between negative 3 and 3, including negative 3 and 3. But now, since we're restricted to integers, that means we only have the possibilities negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So, it's this finite set which is totally different than if we had an R here. So notice if we instead had an R here, we would get the interval negative 3, 2, 3. Okay, good. So I'm going to clean this up, and I want to do one more kind of more interesting example. I want to finish with this example. So let's consider the set A, which is 3A plus 2B, as A and B roll over all of the integers. So let's go ahead and make a chart to form a nice guess about what this set is. Notice that it's going to be a subset of the integers, um, but what subset? So let's say here is maybe... Uh, a is going across the rows and B is going down the columns. So let's maybe have negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and then same thing here. Good. Now we've got our chart built, and now in each of these spots, I'm going to calculate 3A plus 2B and see what we get. So 3A plus 2B here will be negative 6 minus 4, so that's going to be negative 10. Here we're going to have negative 3 minus 4, which is negative 7. Here we're going to have 0 minus 4, which is negative 4. Here we'll have 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. Here we'll have uh, 6 minus 4, which is 2. Good. And now let's see what we have here. So here we're going to have uh, negative 6 minus 2, which is negative 8. Here we're going to have negative 6 minus 0, which is negative 6. And then notice these are going up by 2. So here we're going to have minus 4, minus 2. And actually notice everything is going to go up by 2 as we go down the same column. So here we'll get negative 5, negative 3, negative 1, and then 1. And then here we'll have negative 2, 0, 2, 4. Here we'll have uh, 1, 3, 5, 7. Here we'll have 4, 6, 8, 10. 
So let's look at this chart and let's notice that in this chart we have every integer between negative 8 and 8. So here we have negative 8, negative 7, negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, uh, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Then if we expand this chart even bigger, it's a pretty easy guess to see that maybe we would get all of the integers. And so that's actually going to be our claim, which will prove, I'll clean this up and we'll do that. So now we're ready to state and prove our observation. So our observation is if a equals this set 3a plus 2b as a and b run over all of z, then a is actually just the integers itself. And let's recall that how we, def how we prove that two sets are equal is we prove that if an element is in one, then it has to be in the other and vice versa. In other words, they have exactly the same element. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and look at our proof. So let's start off and suppose that n is in a. Well, that means that n equals 3a plus 2b for a and b in z. But we know that when we combine integers with addition and multiplication, we're back inside the integers. So this means that n is in the integers. And I guess like if you want a technical reason here, it's that's because we're closed under addition slash multiplication. Great. And so that means we've proven the one direction, now we need to prove the other. So maybe the first thing to notice in order to prove the other, it's a pretty trivial thing, but we'll notice that 3 times 1 minus 2 times 1 equals 1. And so what that tells us is that 1 is an element from A, because we've written 1 as a combination of 3 and 2. But we can take this equation and just multiply it by n, and we'll be able to get every element from the integers. And so we'll do that. So let's go ahead and take an arbitrary integer, I'll use m and z, and note that m equals 3m minus 2m, but that's an element from our set, and maybe let's just point out that's with A equals B equals M. Because notice, there's nothing up here that says that A and B are not allowed to be the same. Great, so we started off with M an integer, and we ended up with M in A. Up here we started off with N in A, and we ended up with N an in integer. So putting these both together, we see that A is equal to the set of integers. Okay, so that finishes this video.